The title of my talk is indeed a new wild type in the era of transmitted drug resistance, but actually my title is a question, and it's a good question, uh, which is partly resolved uh, to date. <coughs> um, and I think most of you already know the answer to this question in terms of uh, TDR, but there are many other things that are at play and that change uh, the face of HIV at the population level. So in the next 30 minutes, I will try to give you an overview of some kind of theoretical consideration and some kind of um, evidence from real life how HIV is changing at the population level. Um, I have 60 slides, so I will try to go over it rather uh, fast. So we will start with the virus itself. So it's very easy. HIV is one of the fastest evolving organisms, um, so it's very easy for the virus to generate diversity, and this was shown by uh, the famous paper of Shankarapa in 1999, which nicely illustrates how during the course of infection of an HIV patient, there is a lot of generation of HIV diversity, both in terms of diversity and in divergence. So <clears throat> over, the, over uh, the time course of infection, you see a rapid increase um, that's moving away from the founder virus. And of course, the, the high evolutionary rates of HIV are partly due to, its, uh, to the viral life cycle. Uh, I think this is almost a common knowledge. We have a highly, um, a highly in inefficient polymerase enzyme. We have a very short generation time from the time of entry to the time of maturation. We have a lot of particles that are released from a single cell. And of course, we have template switching during the polymerase step, so we have a high frequency of recombination. So this, all these factors uh, allow the virus to generate a lot of diversity within the host. But of course, HIV is also very diverse at population level. It has been established that the origin of the Group M epidemic was, could be dated back to around, uh, approximately 100 years ago. Uh, in Congo, so in the, uh, at the time it was called Sair. So it started in Kinshasa uh, around 1920, but it's only up to 1960 uh, that there was some kind of an exponential growth in the HIV epidemic. The diversity of HIV at population level is normally classified in different subtypes, which are actually all founder effects um, when there was this spread out of uh, Congo. Um, HIV subtypes differ by, uh, between each other to a large extent. And I've read something very interesting, that if you take all the M proteins, they have less than 65% identity compared to each other, which is very low if you compare it to, if you take the protein orthologs of human and mice, they only diverged uh, around the median of 678% over 90 million years. So it shows that HIV is not only rapidly evolving within a patient, but also between, between hosts. <clears throat> and of course, there was this migration out of Congo, which gave rise to the different subtypes, and also uh, each subtype started its own epidemic globally. And I think, I'm not sure if it's very visible, but you have to, from this paper, you have to look at the timing of the different migrations and some of them are very late, 1990, uh, 1980s. So it's, we can conclude that HIV, given uh, its lifespan, is not circulating at a global level for that, <coughs> for that long. <coughs> so we know that HIV can evolve very rapidly, both within a host and between hosts, which generates a lot of diversity. But the question is, to what extent is this potential exploited by the virus? Um, and one way to, uh, to investigate this is to look at TDR. And TDR is actually a very easy marker for viral uh, adaptation at population level because it's very easy to observe. Uh, TDR has a very big impact on patients' health. For example, I I'm, I'm actually mean Drug resistance has a very strong impact on patient health, so it's very easy to spot drug resistance, and that's why it's also feasible to track TDR over time. And because the routine testing 
that's being done in the clinic. We have a lot of data that's available to track uh, population level uh, adaptation. But of course, there are many other selective forces that are changing HIV at the population level. We have genetic drift, like we have seen with the subtypes, but there is also the adaptation to the host, and there is also an interplay between virulence and transmission uh, that impacts how HIV is able to adapt and to spread at population level. So why is it actually important to monitor, and more importantly, to understand how HIV is evolving at population level? Uh, there are a few items. First of all, it's very clear that you always have to have a good understanding of the current uh, epidemic, uh, because there is this confounding effect. If you want to make uh, association studies of drug resistance or immune escape, I think uh, the art limitation 138A is a good example. Furthermore, we have to understand how TDR is being spread in the population. Are there single episodes or are there, are there multiple independent uh, episodes? If you have multiple independent episodes, we can easily tackle TDR by reducing the number of virological failures. But if there are only a few single episodes of TDR and they're persistent in the population, it's much more difficult to handle. Um, there are also implications for vaccine development. We need to know what is being transmitted and how is exactly being transmitted, at which stages in the disease progression, what is surviving the bottleneck. And then uh, last, uh, the, the genotype. It has been shown that the genotype also has a big impact in, uh, on uh, disease progression, as almost 30% of the variation in set point viral load, so 30% of the variation in disease progression can be explained uh, by the viral genotype. <coughs> so if we want to explore HIV's uh, potential to adapt and circulate, it's very important because HIV is evolving so fast. It's, um, it's important if we look at uh, genetic studies of HIV in an evolutionary context. So that's what we're going to do. I will go over some theoretical considerations to understand HIV can evolve very rapidly, but of course there are limitations, there are different aspects of the epidemic that actually prevent or actually facilitate adaptation of HIV at the population level. And then in the second section, I will show some, um, some reports of adaptation at both levels and how they um, interact with each other. So actually, it's a very complex situation because, of course, the population that we see at the diversity that we see at population level, it's, of course, a direct reflection of the transmission dynamics. It depends on which people, on which risk groups are transmitting HIV between each other. Um, it's, it's, it's obvious that HIV can evolve as much as, as it wants within the host. If there is no sufficient transmission to other hosts, it will never sustain at population level. So there is a complex interplay at different scales, at different epidemiological scales, and that's because the, what is good for HIV uh, within a host is not necessarily good for HIV at population level. Um, it's what's written here on the slide, that a selective advantage of a particular trait can have uh, conflicting forces. Um, and that's why there is a delicate, it has been shown that there is a delicate evolutionary trade-off between virulence and transmission. It means the virus within the host, the virus actually wants to be, become very virulent. It wants to maximize its fitness. But on the, on the other hand, while it's getting more virulent within the host, it's shortening the lifespan of the patient and there is less uh, there is less opportunities to transmit. So the virus has to make a very delicate um, balance between uh, these two aspects. So if we want to link within host and between host evolution, um, you could wonder, is there a direct relationship? All the changes that we see within the host are also manifested at population level. And if so, are the dynamics the same? 
So we also know that HIV is evolving at different rates uh, at the two levels. So on the left, we have a phylogenetic tree of within host evolution, and there you can clearly see uh, selective pressure and rapid diversification, while on the right hand, uh, figure B, we have a tree of between host evolution, so it's a phylogenetic tree taken from multiple patients, and there you see completely different uh, effect. There is less diver diversification in time. There was also a very nice study from Zanini and colleagues in 2015, where they show that actually the, the frequencies, the nucleotide substitution frequencies within a host and between a host, so within a particular host, and at population level are actually very comparable. So on this figure, figure A, we can see four groups, and you have to pay attention to the red and the green line. Those two cases is where a particular patient, so in the study of Sanini, they followed, and I'm not sure if you're familiar with the study, but they had like nine patients, which they followed up uh, more than 10 years, and they did some NGS of the different time points. So they have a very good idea what is happening within each patient. And what I saw was that when the founder virus, so the virus that, the virus that initially infected the patient, when it doesn't resemble the subtype consensus or the group M consensus, that the virus is much more uh, evolving and it's uh, evolving away from the founder virus and it's more evolving towards this consensus. So um, it shows that actually HIV within a host, it has to adapt and it has to make sure it survives within the patient, but actually it's also to some large extent trying to mimic the consensus sequence at population level. Um, we have a similar study that's uh, almost um, impressed, where we, for example, we took all sequences from the Stanford database and we compared um, the, the nucleotide frequencies at each site. I think it was a poll, uh, the poll enzyme. So at each site, we, we measured nucleotide frequencies at population level. We also took an old data set from Bachelor. I think it's a data set from 1999. It's like, it mimics an NGS data set. It was clonal sequencing. But you can clearly see that there is a good correlation between uh, nucleotide frequencies within the patient and at uh, population level. So how do we actually reconcile the two? Uh, luckily, in recent years, there is a lot of work being published, both from a theoretical side and from an experimental side. And actually, we can consider three stages. First stage is, of course, we need to know what is being generated within a single host and how does it affect its probability for transmission. Second, we need to know what is actually being passed on of this vast amount of uh, of diversity being generated. Not everything will be passed to the next host. And thirdly, we need to know, okay, maybe it's passed from one host to another, but we also need to know what's being kept, what is being fixed at the population level. Now, for the first part, the within host. Actually, HIV is evolving rapidly within a single host, but there is no single or almost no single evidence uh, that a viral trait directly promotes uh, transmission from one host to another. Of course, if you look at different HIV strains, they differ in their ab ability to transmit, but it's mostly an indirect consequence of disease progression. Um, I summed up here three aspects. So we have the viral load. We know that viral load, um, the probability of transmission is proportional to the, to the level of um, to the number of uh, the viral copies in the blood. We also know that there's adaptation going on in the host, either it's treatment or immune, but it will have an effect on what's being transmitted. And uh, thirdly, there is also lack of evolution. So the first, uh, regarding the, the viral load. So if you take, if you consider the time span of, uh, of an infection from the, from the beginning of infection to the point of uh, AIDS, we know that HIV is not always as infectious. Um, and that's because 
the viral load is changing heavily, um, as you can see on the figure. So the viral load is the highest in the acute phase, so the acute phase is assumed to be the most infectious uh, time point. But of course, there's also something called set point viral load. It's some kind of a steady state uh, between, the, between HIV and the host immune system. And the level of the set point viral load, you can see on the figure, the level, uh, the black line is much higher than the green line. Of course, the black line or patient from which the black line uh, comes from has a higher probability of transmitting all the changes that it's uh, accumulating during the course of infection. Then secondly, we have adaptation. So as we saw with uh, previously, HIV is continu continuously diverging and diversifying, normally uh, to escape the immune, uh, to escape the immune uh, system of the host. But there is, for example, also um, the aspect of treatment. It also has to adapt to treatment. Um, and all these changes are, are, of course, guided by viral fitness, competitive fitness, but there are some restrictions. If you look at the sequence space, HIV has 10,000 nucleotide positions. You can calculate the number of possible variants uh, possible in theory, but of course it's much, much, much less because of different constraints. And you have to consider when you have an escape mutation uh, against the immune system or treatment, of course it has an effect on fitness and it will affect of course the viral load and the transmissibility of the variant. So these are all aspects that of course affect how HIV is able to evolve at population level. And thirdly, I will go over it very quickly, evolutionary imprints, it's when a, a, a particular patient gets infected with a virus from the donor and the donor is specifically adapted the virus from the donor is specifically adapted to that specific host. It's transmitted to a recipient, which has, for example, a different HLA allele. So the virus is uh, less adapted, and maybe it has more difficulty to evolve because it's under much more stringent selective pressure from the immune system. And we also have reservoirs. So these are uh, um, uh, established early in infection, so they don't the viruses that reservoirs release during uh, the course of infection, they're not very well adapted to the host and they have been assumed to be associated with lower uh, viral loads. But in the end, it's very important to keep in mind uh, that HIV within host evolution is short-sighted. Um, so it means that it will make a lot of changes which are very beneficial for a specific host but on the, other, on, on the other hand, it can severely limit its ability to, to transmit to another, uh, to another host. So um, then, so we have, we have had a level of within, um, within uh, host evolution, but there is also something like the, the bottleneck uh, at the transmission event. And here there are two things important. We have social dynamics and biological processes. Uh, social dynamics means, for example, how is the interaction between uh, different risk groups of people within the risk group. There's something called a time interval. If a risk group is very rapidly transmitting HIV from one patient to another, the time interval is within one single host is very short, so there's not much room for adaptation. Um, then there's also been a lot of discussion which time point in the course of infection is most infectious. It's normally assumed that, that, that the acute phase is the most infectious, that, that most transmissions occur during the acute phase. But of course, if you see TDR and also evidence from uh, TASP shows that there is a lot of transmission beyond acute infection as well. And we also have, of course, have these immunological and physical barriers. So it's not just a, stoch a stochastic event. We have a lot of variants in one host. It's HIV is transmitted to another host, which of these variants is actually being transmitted. So we know that there is a strong genetic, genetic bottleneck, which is shown if you compare virus population from the donor-recipient pair. In the donor, it's very homogeneous. If you look at the recipient, it's very, uh, very homogeneous. 
and it has been established that infection of HIV normally includes the transmission of one single variant. If you look at the strength of selection, then we also know from experiments that there is actually um, some preference for specific strains to be transmitted. And that, for example, that this uh, preference is linked to the similarity of the transmitted virus uh, to the HIV consensus sequence, sequence. So also here, as we saw previously, there is some kind of tendency to transmit viruses that resemble the consensus, the population consensus, uh, maximally. Uh, and then the last aspect, we know that uh, HIV is being transmitted between different patients, but also there, there is some kind of a selective force acting on which virus is eventually being kept in the population. Uh, that is this transmission potential from the group of uh, Christoph Fraser. And actually they have shown that viral genotypes with an intermediate virulence are naturally selected by transmission. So at population level, there is also some kind of a selection to for specific genotypes that fit this balance between being virulent and still being able to transmit. And of course, there have to be some kind of a theory that connects the two. How can you say that HIV is short-sighted and at the, at, at the same time it has to still be, be able to transmit? And one uh, very popular theory is that says that there's this preferential transmission of ancestral viruses which have an inher inherent transmission advantage. So either there's tr transmission of the, the viruses from early in infection or from release from the reservoirs. And this is a nice figure from Catherine Lidgo, which summarizes everything. So the red line is actually the consensus that's being transmitted irrespective of all the different evolution that's going on within a single patient. So we have had some kind of theoretical considerations. Let's look at some evidence from real life. Um, I picked four. We have natural diversity, drug resistance, immune escape. They are both similar. And then disease progression. So natural diversity, the first question is, what is actually the wild type? People sometimes use a, a HXP2. Some other people use the consensus, but what is, of course, the consensus? The consensus changes in time, changes the, according to the geographic uh, um, location. And of course, each subtype has its own wild type. And you have to be very careful for a confounding effect of subtype. It has been shown already a lot that you have to correct for this, but I think there are still plenty examples of association studies that find mutations which are actually just uh, subtype bias. I think that 138A is a good one, but also in integrase we have seen uh, some mutations which I, I, I don't think they're actually uh, well identified. Then of course uh, you can also ex wonder, just take one particular subtype, what is the possible exploration that the subtype, that the virus of that subtype can do at population level? Of course, there are many constraints, but it has been shown that there is only a modest increase in diversity. So there is this study from Wu, there is a study from, they're all from the group of David Robertson. For example, you take sequences from 20 years, of course you see an increase in diversity, the trees will become bigger and bigger, but actually it's a very modest, increase if you look at in the light of HIV um, evolutionary rates and it has been shown that there are some kind of fixed pathways for the virus to explore this huge sequence space and I think there's again this nice example from uh, Zanini and the colleagues that have shown that of course that we, we, we saw it in a previous slide if you take diversity within a host and a population level they resemble each other quite quite well and you have a lot of reversion to the consensus so one third of all the changes so they did NGS of, of samples of spanning 10 years of all the changes that I saw one of one th one third of these changes were actually reversions to the consensus and they state that the global group M consensus sequence actually presents an optimal sequence this is a study from uh, colleagues from Germany. Uh, they looked at 
integrase. It's now very, uh, very relevant these days. So they also looked at the time span of decades, and they saw time trends in particular polymorphisms, actually um, polymorphisms that were co-varying with each other. And they also suggest that there is an ongoing adaptation of integrase over time at population level. Then the second one, TDR. Um, I think we have many TDR specialists in the audience, so I will go very briefly about this. I think there have been many studies by now looking also at very big time spans, and I, I think I can say that they all almost conclude the same, uh, the same message, that it's, trends are similar over time. Of course, it depends on specific regions, subtypes, and of course, if it's a, a recent infection or it's a recently diagnosed patient. But we can say that in high-income countries, TDR is uh, either being stable or decreasing, while in low-income countries, we see a lot of we see a lot of, we see a lot of fluctuations uh, depending on the treatment programs. So this is one study from Olsen and colleagues from the Eurocourt. So 95% of their patients are from Europe. You can see clear uh, decrease in in TDR. This is from Fabini and colleagues. They see similar trends. They see an uprise or a uh, a a uh, some attention for the trend of the NNRTIs that's known. Um, the NNRTIs and specific mutation, the 103N, deserves some attention. So if we see TDR, we mostly see singletons and uh, single drug class. So TAMS, L90M, 103N, uh, these are all very old mutations, and they have limited uh, impact on current treatment programs, except for the NNRTIs. So the, the, the table here is from 2006, a very old table, but I think the mutations are still very relevant if you look at transmission clusters. I will come back to that. So, okay, we know TDR. It's only single mutations or limited to a particular drug class, but we want to know of course, what are the dynamics? Is it mostly from treated to naive, or is there persistent lineages ongoing among naive patients? You can investigate this phylogenetically. So uh, Murat and colleagues investigated the UK drug resistance database, and they found that 70% of TDR had a treatment naive source. You can also explore it statistically. Very simplistic, you take the prevalence of mutations in drug naive patients and drug experienced patients, you make just a clear correlation. Everything that deviates from the one-to-one -one ratio either indicates rapid reversion or persistence at population level. And also the colleagues from Murat, Murat again, did a similar analysis, but I looked at prevalence of mutations within a drug-naive population and within specific transmission clusters, and they could derive some similar statistics. So I think for uh, TDR, we can conclude that there is significant onward transmission from untreated patients, which is ex explaining uh, most of uh, the TDR that we see now, and um, that there are self-sustaining resistance lineages because m the most mutations that we see are actually selected by drugs that are not prescribed uh, anymore. And we have very long TDR uh, transmission chains which show that some mutations are very slow in reverting. Um, there's a study from Castro where they looked at uh, reversion rates, and there's also this one from Murat, uh, which looked at persistence within specific clusters, and I think they all confirmed the same uh, findings. So I have two more sections to go. So we have the immune escape. From the immune escape, it's very simple. It's almost similar as with drug resistance, uh, you can also have escape. There can also be some kind of accumulation of escape mutations at population level. Only there it's less clear how it's evolving um, in terms of quantity and uh, dynamics. Uh, but this is a very famous paper from uh, Kawashima, I think uh, most of you know it, that, that where they have shown that the prevalence of a specific allele correlates very well to the, to the epitope mutation for that specific allele. And then there is also this study from 
Kinlog and colleagues, where they show that, the, so the tree on the left, the small, okay, so it's time, I just need a few more minutes. Uh, so the tree on the left, so it's the same subtype, the tree on the left is from the 1980s, the tree on the right is from uh, uh, the 2000s, you see a massive increase in diversity, but they show that the significant proportion of this increase was due to HLA adaptation because uh, so most of this uh, entropy changes, so most of diversity occurred at uh, HLA associated sites. This is also from their study where you can see that there was a twofold increase in sequence diversity, which was almost entirely due to an increase in polymorph epitope polymorphism frequency. Um, and then you can wonder what is the effect of this pre-adaptation at population level. Um, and I think in the end it's very low. I would advise you to read the paper. But from this figure, it means that you, you can see four, four bars and they represent four different uh, time points. Uh, you look at, look at the two on the most right side, where you have historic samples from the 1980s and the modern. And uh, we can see that there is an increasing proportion of sequences that are partially adapted, but in the end it's still a minor increase and it's also only a minor increase in adaptation. And then the last part is disease progression. Um, we can also wonder what is transmission of disease progression. Uh, we know that there is variability in the rate of progression. We have rapid progressors and slow progressors. Uh, this is to some extent attributable to variability in the set point viral load. If you take all the patients and we look at their set point viral load, there is variation, but there is an optimum, as we shown before, with this uh, transmission potential. Uh, they have looked at what does explain this variability in set point viral load. There is a viral factor. There's a, there are certain uh, aspects of the genotype that explain this variability, um, up to 30%, and then you could wonder what are these uh, what are these viral factors. There's a lot of studies going on at this moment to uh, explore the different polymorphisms of features of the genotype. Uh, this is one study from us where we show pre from 2012 where we show that specific polymorphisms related to treatment pressure. So these are polymorphisms that increase in prevalence during treatment also correlated well with viral load in drug-naive patients. So it means that these polymorphisms have also some kind of an effect on viral load and virulence in absence of treatment. This was in protease. And we have one study, which was a CRF linked to faster progression. So CRF19, it's a CRF where the pole is from subtype D. So it was a study in Cuba, so all the I think we had a number of patients infected with a specific CRF. They were all rapid progressors. And if you did then a network analysis, you, yeah, I don't have a mouse, I think, okay. Here you have rapid progressors, you have the CRF, and you can see that higher fitness in protease was associated with rapid, more rapid progression. And you should be aware that uh, the protease of the CRF is subtype D, which was also shown by the group of Olivier Leyendecker, which showed that if you compare different subtypes, they differ in disease, in the rate of disease progression, and they could trace it back to the pole region. So the pole has the biggest impact on uh, variability in replication capacity and disease progression. So to conclude, I think it's a very short conclusion. Uh, HIV is evolving rapidly within a host, between a host. Um, but it's actually very constrained in its, in its, uh, in its uh, ability to evolve at population level. Um, there are a lot of constraints, and actually the virus always wants to, wants to go back to the consensus sequence. Um, but we need to monitor uh, HIV, of course, uh, also today. And we should look, maybe look at indiv individual sites, combination, and maybe very specific features. Okay, and then, yeah, I want to thank some groups and um, my colleagues and all my co-authors, of course. Okay.